Thank you so much, Phil. That is exactly the kind of conversation we wanted to bring to this forum today. And it was the embodiment of an enlightened retail leader. And notice that we didn't talk about pixels and we didn't talk about you can capture attention in people's physical spaces with digital today. That conversation was all about the new role of the store. And to really think about how we maximize this evolving role of the store, you have to take a wide angle lens. That's what Phil just shared with us. You have to look at everything that's affecting culture today and how people are shopping, how they're discovering, and how we're tracking how to serve them to sell to them. And that's a whole different way to think. And another thing that, that our firm talks about a lot is the impact of the superpowers of Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. We cannot be in experience design, and we cannot be in digital experience design, and we cannot be in retail if we are not actively tracking and thinking about how we need to respond to these four today and also the future. Clearly, Facebook alone has created huge implications to the kind of data analysis we're doing in physical spaces, the kind of data analysis that we can do to understand if our strategies are working or not and how to respond accordingly. So we wanted to bring an expert in today to talk about GAFA and to help us understand what do we need to be thinking about for these four, how does it affect retail today, and how do we in the digital experience design business, particularly focused on retail stores, need to respond? And thank you very much. We have Stefan Nasser here from Faber Novel. It was very difficult to find a speaker for this topic, and we are delighted to have you. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Stefan, and this is truly my pleasure to be here today uh, to talk with you about the GAFA, retail, and how the former impact the latter. Um, just before we start, uh, I'd like to know who here works in retail for a retailer. Just please show of hand. Okay, now keep your hands up. Those who work with the retail industry, be it a supplier, consultant, partners, vendors. Okay, thank you. So that's great because what I'm going to talk about today is retail much more than digital signage. So uh, I just want to make sure of that. One more thing, this is gonna be um, maybe kind of an ana analytical presentation. I'm gonna share a few numbers, a few frameworks. So uh, I'm gonna share um, by the end of the week uh, all those key numbers with the sources online on LinkedIn. So if you just want to dive a little bit deeper later, you have an opportunity to do that. So, um, so let's start. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, as you can tell, I'm French. <laughs> I was born in Paris. I studied business in France and also in China. And two things happened when I, when I was in Shanghai. First, I met my wife there, so that's something. And uh, second, I did my uh, end of study project uh, for PayPal China. So basically, I spent three months studying everything and researching everything about cross-border e-commerce between China and the rest of the world. So I guess that's an unusual way to, to discover retail, but that's how I, I was started in this, in this field. Then moving forward, I graduated. I joined Microsoft uh, in France, and I ended up uh, running the operations for their Microsoft Accelerator program. And there, 50% of the job was really how can we help our portfolio startups, so innovative tech, connect with Microsoft clients, large corporations. And that's how I got into corporate innovation. And I did that for quite some time. I enjoyed it very much. But then I got a call and I got an offer to, uh, to move to, to San Francisco. And that's an offer you cannot refuse when you love tech and innovation as much as I do. So now I work for Faber Novell, an innovation agency. And what we believe in at Faber Novell is that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So if you, if you look at the innovation hubs like Shanghai, uh, Silicon Valley, Paris, here you have all the innovation, all the tech that's happening. And what we try to do is take that knowledge, we study those ecosystems, we uh, connect with the players, and we bring that knowledge to our clients, uh, be it in the form of education, training, startup sourcing, tech integration, etc. 
So it puts us in a very interesting position. Uh, obviously, we work with a lot of retailers and uh, consumer brands. So it gives us this kind of uh, view on both sides. We have one foot in the uh, tech world, startup world, VC world, and one foot in the corporate innovation world. Now to the topic, the four superpowers of GAFA. Uh, this is a survey. Who before that presentation never heard of the term GAFA or was not familiar with it? Okay. And actually, it's perfectly normal. GAFA is uh, an acronym for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon that, uh, that came from France. So it's one of our free inventions with the VAT. Uh, we're very proud of it. Uh, and it spreads uh, throughout Europe. And originally, it doesn't have a very nice string. When we used to talk about GAFA at the beginning, it was those scary tech giants that are going to disrupt our lovely uh, local champions. So this, is, uh, th this was part of a uh, phase where we were seeing innovation coming fast, and we didn't really know uh, what to do with that, and the first thing we did was put a name on it. So we called them the GAFAs. Um, and in that presentation, just, just to, to, to give you a, a heads up, I'm going to focus mostly on Amazon and Google. Um, there's a lot to say, obviously, Apple is uh, major retailer, the most profitable per square footage. Uh, Facebook is doing a lot of stuff too, but we have to make choices. So I'm really going to focus on those two, and I'm happy to take questions uh, later on. So GAFA is, um, oh, today it means tech giants when we talk about them in Europe. But personally, and I talked about that I think with a few of you yesterday, I, I don't really like that term. Um, I think it's blurry because there is no clear definition of what GAFA means. I put a few names on that slide, and any of them could also be a GAFA. Why not? What is the definition of our GAFA? Actually, we do have new acronyms for those new players. Uh, we have the Chinese GAFA, the Baytics, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, Xiaomi. We have the second generation GAFA, the Natu, uh, Netflix, Airbnb, Tesla, Uber. And there is a new one that I see more and more in US publications that is FAMGA, uh, including Microsoft. And that actually kind of makes sense, because if you go by, by market cap, the FAMGA are indeed the largest tech companies in the world. So does it really make sense to talk about them as an entity? And people keep doing it because they still feel that all those companies share something in common. So we try to look into it. We try to look into their business model and try to understand what exactly those companies share. Why are they so successful? What is the, um, the secret sauce, if you will, behind uh, those, those massive successes? And behind that, what can we learn from them? So we try to think, OK, let's forget that Google is an advertising company. Let's forget that Amazon is uh, an e-commerce company. And what are the working principles that they use? And we identified four of them that we call the four superpowers of GAFA. So here, here they are. There's the magnet enterprise, real-time enterprise, the infinite enterprise, and the intimate enterprise. So uh, again, you can find all of this online. The, the, the study is public. Uh, it's called Gaphanomics. Uh, we published them between 2012 and now because it's an ongoing project we have. And what I'm going to do right now is just go over each of them and give an example, an application in retail with Amazon so that we really get a good grasp of, OK, what this means. First, the magnet enterprise. Uh, the idea here is basically the capacity of those GAFAs to aggregate small units of value that individually are almost worthless and turn them into an insanely valuable asset once they are put together on a platform. So if you think about, um, well, obviously, think about all the empty rooms in Barcelona or in Paris at a given time. Individually, they're not worth much. Now, if you put them together, you get Airbnb, the most valuable uh, hospitality company in the world. In retail, uh, that's probably the best example is with the third part uh, sellers uh, of Amazon. So you probably know that Amazon not only sells, I mean, we all know that Amazon not only sell uh, their own product, but also third party product. But what we don't always realize is the scale of that. Over 50% of Amazon sales in volume last year came from third-party sellers. It's like, 
Walmart's saying, okay, anybody can sell stuff in our parking lot, and we'll take a 15% commission on that. And it actually doubles their, their sales volume. So that's massive. And that's something that those GAFAs are really, really good at. The second one is the real-time enterprise. Another thing the GAFAs are really good at is not only building continuous feedback loops, so that's, I'd say we all do that, but they're really good at adjusting their product and operation in real time based on those feedback loops. They don't wait for next week or next month or next quarter. They don't really care about next quarter. They adjust in real time. Um, the obvious one we all have in mind is the price adjustment on Amazon. We all know that Amazon adjusts the price. Well, the last figure I could find, but maybe you have a better one. In 2014, it's estimated that Amazon adjusted their prices every day 2.5 million times. <laughs> yes. Uh, when you think about it, uh, it's shocking. A retail, a traditional retailer, well, you, can, you just cannot do that. Uh, but that's the obvious one. I want to share with you a really cool one uh, that is a little less uh, famous. Uh, so this is a patent that Amazon filed in uh, December 2013. Um, and what it says is, so that's something that Amazon called the anticipatory shipping. They're saying that based on your online behavior in real time, based on your purchase history, they're able to know if you're gonna buy a product before you buy it. And because they're so confident in that technology, they will start shipping it even before you purchase it. And that's, that's a patent. As, as far as I know, it's not implemented yet. But this is definitely the direction they're going, uh, they're going towards. And more than that, um, if you read the patent, they, they also say something that, that is really mind-blowing. They say that if they send something to someone, uh, let's say they, they send you some, some, some stuff, and, well, you didn't buy it, right? you didn't purchase it, maybe you went to the supermarket, who knows. Uh, well, you can still keep it for free because they're so confident in their tech that they can do that. They can afford to do that. And by the way, it's the same thing at the Amazon Go store. So if you've been to Seattle, if you've tried the, you know, just walk-in store, if you grab something and the, the sensors didn't detect it and you get, get it for free, you can keep it. It's fine. You know, it's part of the experience and it's also part of the tech. That's the standards they want to set. And I'll get to that in a minute, setting the standards. That's, that's really key. So that's, that's just, I mean, I love it. Uh, <laughs> the third one is the infinite enterprise. And this one is uh, strongly tied with the software nature of the GAFAs. This is about scalability. If tomorrow um, one of you want to start an um, Amazon competitor, you will pay a lot upfront for the tech, you'll pay a lot to set up the, the store and to set up the infrastructure. But once this is all set up, and once you have reached the critical size, serving one more customer is almost free. The marginal cost is, uh, is near zero. So it means that past a certain point, you're shooting for 100% profit margin per customer. And this allows you to do insane stuff. Uh, I'll give two examples. One, it's the number of customers that you can serve. Do you know how many people uh, buy stuff at, in a Walmart store uh, on a given month? Just give a random number. Come on, just help me. <laughs> okay. 39, okay, it's actually on average 30 to 40,000 people buy something at a given Walmart store per month. Uh, Amazon serves with one website 200 million visitors. So that's, that's the first thing, because they have the scale, they, have, they can scale the distribution channel, 200 million people with only one store to manage, one store to maintain. But again, that's the obvious one. The non-obvious one is how they scale their loyalty program. Um, who has uh, Amazon Prime membership? Okay. So th this, I was pretty confident with that question because more than half of American households today have an Amazon Prime membership. Um, uh, and, the, and you're right, I mean, I have it too, uh, because first you get the two-day free delivery shipping, so that was the original deal. It's 100 bucks per year, and you, you, you get two-day delivery, free delivery. But that, that's nice. And then they added uh, free unlimited access to the Amazon Video library, right? 
So maybe you don't need Netflix anymore. And then they added for free uh, unlimited um, audiobooks with Audible. And then they also threw in um, the, um, uh, actually um, e-books uh, that you can read on Kindle. And now, since they acquired uh, Whole Foods, as you all know, in, some, in a few cities, you have two hour free delivery from Whole Foods, uh, with, for your Whole Foods groceries. This is all for the same $100, because again, once they have built the infrastructure, once they have reached the critical size, they can afford to give all of that for free. And that's exactly what Jeff Bezos says, Amazon CEO, he, he, he makes it very clear. We give you videos for free because you know we know you're gonna buy more shoes from us because of that. So that's, again, um, typical from software company, typical from the GAFAs. Um, I, I mean, we could give many more examples, but I'll try to stick to retail for that. Yeah, so this is number of visitors on Amazon website that I mentioned. And the last one, intimate enterprise. And this is a big one, and this is probably gonna be the, the, in the next few years, the most important one, because it is um, connected to the capacity to use data. And with the latest, um, latest improvements uh, in artificial intelligence, we're, gonna, we're going to see tangible, effective applications of that principle. The intimate enterprise is the ability to deliver a customized experience at the individual level, okay? Let's say that um, Brett and I, uh, hey Brett, let's say that we go together to uh, Target. We are going to go through the same else. We're going to be presented with the same products. But I'm French, so what I want is basically show me the cheese, show me the wine, show me the baguette, and that's what I want to see, right? So that's something that Amazon does with their um, recommendation algorithm. It's estimated that 35% of the sales they do come from this recommendation algorithm. And it's true even for Apple. You, you could say, yeah, okay, that's true for software, but Apple is hardware. Yes, but when you buy an iPhone, within 30 minutes you have installed a ton of apps, you have logged into your Apple account. So this is a unique iPhone that you have in your hands. And that's the power of those GAFAs. They create customized personal experiences. If you get in an Apple store, they know. Before you talk to them, they know uh, who you are, what's your latest purchase, if you had trouble with your iPhone in the past two, two weeks. So that's all related to the capacity to capture data and to use that data. They're really not only capturing data, right? Because we, we can put sensors in the store. That's not a problem. But then you have to clean that data, to label it, to structure it, and to find relevant applications for that and deploy it at scale. And they know how to do that. So yes, those are the four GAFA superpower. Um, and those superpowers made an impact in the retail world. Um, and now for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to, give, to share our vision of the new world order in retail. Um, talking about a new world order means that there was an old order uh, the old order we all have in mind is like Walmart at the top, your mom, uh, moms and pops daily at the bottom, and all the usual suspects in between. Um, this is changing. And I'm going to talk about apes for that. Uh, I'm sure some of you see where I'm going with that. If you look at the innovation life cycle, you have this early phase where adoption is slow, and then there's a tipping point, and suddenly there's this hypergrowth phase, the tornado. And during that tornado phase, um, the order changes. The champions uh, are pushed back and new champions emerge. And this was theorized by a guy called Geoffrey Moore with those three categories. He says, after this hypergrowth phase, so for a few years, it's going to be a fierce fight to, to grab as much land as the players can. And at the end of the day, when the tornado dies down, we have three types of players left. We have the gorillas, the chimps, and the monkeys. This is easier, like, oh, we don't see that well. Okay. So the gorillas, the gorilla, uh, I, I mean, I guess some of you may know, but I just want to go for it. Um, the gorilla is the new market leader. He sets a standard. He's the, the big guy. The chimps, they are the guys who could have been the gorilla, but for any reason, they missed the opportunity. And now they're... they're they follow fast. They imitate the gorilla, but they're not setting the standards anymore. And lastly, you have the monkeys. So you know the monkeys, this small ape that's very agile, jumps around, 
uh, runs on the, on the branches, and the monkeys can sit on smaller branches where the gorilla couldn't sit because it's too heavy. So it's the same idea. These are small agile companies that find a niche that is probably not variable for the gorilla, so they are safe, and they find their sweet spots, and they thrive in that sweet spot. So they'll never be as big as a gorilla, but it's fine. That's not their purpose. So what I'm going to do now is kind of unpack what's happening in retail and let you make your own judgment as to who is a gorilla, who is a chimp, who is a monkey, and then we can, we can discuss that. First, let's look at the, the size, because it matters. Um, here you have, on the left of the, the red line, you have the GAFAs, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook by market cap. On the right side, you have the traditional retailers. I don't know if you had this, like this order of magnitude in mind. This is what it is today. Uh, to make it even more obvious, I'm going to isolate Amazon. Here it is. Okay, now it really gives us a good sense of scale. Amazon, as of today, is three times as big as Walmart in market cap and larger than the top five uh, aggregated together. So those numbers date back from two weeks ago. Probably Facebook is lower now because of all the data issues they had. And also I didn't include Home Depot, Loves. I really focus on the horizontal players, not the specialist ones. This is what it looks like. So from the first approach, it seems like Amazon is the gorilla today. But I think that we're still in the tornado phase. I think that this is, the change is still happening and this may change. But let's look at Amazon. If you ask me today, what Amazon, if I have to say, okay, what is Amazon doing right now? I would say Amazon is trying to build the perfect retail experience. That's what they're trying to achieve. And I'm going to give you a few examples here. So the first thing they're doing is entering brick, brick and mortar. They acquired Whole Foods, we all know that. They also launched their Amazon Go that I mentioned earlier, so that you have a seamless um, physical experience when you, when you buy, you know, just walk in, grab your stuff, and uh, walk without paying. And they also have filed a few patents uh, for AR and VR. So we, can, we are going to see some stuff uh, happening in the next few years regarding brick and mortar. Now, why is Amazon entering brick and mortar? Um, that's something I'll, I'll address a, a little later, but basically they realize that they cannot deliver enough experience, they cannot create enough contact with the client, and they need to be brick and mortar because as we all know now, it's an omnichannel world, and you cannot just be online. Second thing Amazon did is acquire, uh, have, do some of you know this device bottom left? It's a ring bell. Uh, so ring is a, a smart um, bell company that got acquired by Amazon for, uh, I think, $1 billion, if, I, if I'm not, yeah, thank you, for $1 billion, because Amazon wants to get access, not only to your door, but to your fridge. So the next thing that they're, the next feature they're gonna enroll, and they're already testing this as a pilot, is delivering your, your, your stuff, dropping it not at your doorstep, but in your freezer and in your fridge. That's what I call a perfect retail experience. Third thing, and th th this was uh, a success uh, for Christmas last year, I, I got one uh, myself. Uh, it was my wife's present, but anyway, I wanted one. Uh, <laughs> So this is the Amazon Alexa, so the voice assistant. And this is important for Amazon for two reasons. One, because it's a first tried in uh, voice shopping, and we don't know yet if it's gonna be big. Looks like it may be. Still looking at really what applications are relevant. The use case is not obvious. It's also important because it's powered by AI, and it allows Amazon to imp collect data. Uh, Alexa keeps recording even when you're not using it. They're learning about you. Amazon is also in content with Amazon Prime Video. Uh, Amazon spends almost as much as Netflix in video production. They have their own uh, pro production studio. But they're not a content company, or are they? So now they're also selling that. And the last point is healthcare. Amazon is entering healthcare. They announced last month a partnership with two financial companies, Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, and the really interesting thing here, the way they are going after the market. They're going after it in a very Amazon way, and a way that is very disruptive to the traditional players. What they announced 
is that they're going to go after the medic, uh, Medicaid population. This is the population that is usually underserved because they're not interesting for traditional players, right? They don't have money. But as usual with Amazon, it's not about profits, it's about market shares. So they're going to grab as much land as they can, again, the tornado, and once they're in a position of power, they're going to set new standards for the game. Oh, by the way, Walmart also un um, unrolled, I think it was in 2014, also un um, unrolled their own healthcare um, uh, offer. But the, the approach of Amazon is an, uh, the approach of a GAFA. It's an approach that goes with a very competitive, aggressive approach, as opposed to we're gonna do business as usual, we're just gonna offer the same usual product in our store. Now Walmart. Because if we go back to our slides here, well, I mean, it's really Amazon and Walmart at the end of the day, it's really a face-off. Nobody has a size to compete against Amazon except maybe Walmart. Uh, does any of you know the name of the gentleman, uh, bottom left? Yeah. So Mark Lauer is the CEO. So originally he was the CEO of diapers.com that got acquired by Amazon. Then he went on and founded jet.com that got acquired by Walmart. And he's usually regarded as the second best in e-commerce right after Jeff Bezos. Walmart paid $3.3 billion for that acquisition, uh, including $3 billion in cash. And some people said this was an acquihire because they just wanted the guy to run their uh, e-commerce um, department. And that may be true. Mark Lord did a great job in the last 12 months. He grew almost tenfold Walmart inventory in e-commerce. He, he enrolled a new um, two-day free delivery of $35, which is also interesting because you don't necessarily want to pay 100 bucks per year with Amazon, with, with uh, Jet.com, with Walmart. You can have it as long as you spend over $35, $35 per order. So it's an interesting alternative. He made Walmart more aggressive in terms of uh, investment and acquisitions. So it was a smart move. And on top of that, Jet brings, so at the time of the acquisition, Jet had, I think, $500 million in sales. So it's not a small feat. But more than that, Jet is also another brand image for Walmart. Many people would not shop on Walmart.com because it's just not for them in terms of, of positioning. Jet.com offers Walmart uh, access to a new target that they couldn't reach otherwise. So 3.3 .3 billion, maybe, maybe it's a lot of money, but it's probably the price for long-term vision and for Walmart to, to rise up to the challenge. So if you ask me today, what is Walmart doing? I would say they're catching up pretty fast. They're stepping up to the challenge. They know that they're basically the only player that could challenge Amazon today. So they're doing what they have to. That's really interesting. It, it's really a case of a company that uh, it took time for them to, to, to wake up, and it's normal. I mean, it's a, it's a company with a history, with a culture, with an infrastructure. They have legacy, so they have to drag their own weight. But at the end of the day, they're, they're really stepping up to the challenge. So we talked about Amazon, we talked about Walmart. What about the others? This is uh, a CNN article uh, from last year, I think, yeah. That, that titled Amazon versus Walmart, rest of retail fights for crumbs. That's harsh. That may be true. That's at least what it looked like until recently. Because, yeah, uh, when you're uh, Target or Costco, you cannot really afford $3 billion acquisitions. So you're not playing with the same weapons. What can you do? You know, uh, Amazon can, if they really want it, they can just buy you with money. Because they can just throw money at you. So, so that was the case until recently, because recently something happened. Um, I'm sure many of you noticed the announcement by Google two weeks ago. They're improving their Google Shopping slash Google Express. They're still debating the, the, the name uh, platform. So this is Google Express today. Google has created a partnership with 70 traditional retailers, the rest of retail. And those guys can sell their products on Google platform, and that's the typical Google approach, you know, the open platform, as opposed to, I'm Amazon, you go by my rules, Google is an open platform, 
and that's, that's a really, really interesting move. This is basically a menage à trois, as you would say uh, in French. You have, on the, on the one hand, you have Google. On the other hand, you have the traditional retailers, and then you have the consumer. Google has the consumer. He has the traffic. The retailers, the traditional retailers, they have the inventory, they have the distribution channels, and we, well, we have the money as uh, customers. So what Google is, is doing, and if, okay, let's say, just to show you what it looks like. If today you Google this uh, Bose QuietComfort uh, headset, this is what you're gonna see on Google Shopping. You can buy and put in your cart products coming from any retailer. You, it's a totally seamless experience. It doesn't matter if you're buying it from uh, Target or Costco, you will not know it. You will just see a small print saying, okay, this, is, this, comes from, this one comes from Best Buy, I think. That's all you're gonna see. And you're gonna pay all at once. You have a universal cart. So it's a perfectly seamless experience. So Google is basically providing the tech and plugging the retail world on their technology. And it's brilliant because Google has, well, many stuff that we mentioned for Amazon, Google has them. I mean, if you think about the, the voice shopping, for example, you have Google Voice. Um, if you think about the loyalty program, Google has the data, so Google has a tech and provides that tech to the, um, to the retailers. And what's even more interesting is that Google is shifting their business model because with that, Google is not selling advertising. They're taking a commission out of the sales. So Google is now like, competing head up with, with Amazon. And that's, that's probably gonna be, a, it's still early. I don't want to, to, to make any pronostic, but I think this may be a game changer. I think this may really be a game changer. If Google is serious about it, and that's a whole question, because at this point, the traditional retailers need Google more than Google needs them. So if Google is serious about that retail thing, then this may become a, a big change in the industry. And last, last but not least, there are all the guys we're not talking about because they're small, because they fly under the radar, um, and yet they are opening new ways, a new path to retail. Uh, Casper, Warby Parker, Eddie, Stitch Fix, Instacart, Shopify, could add Groupon also, uh, Beta probably. Uh, all those guys are reinventing retail in their own way. They found a sweet spot where Amazon is probably never gonna go. I mean, Casper, so they're selling mattresses online. They're a digital, native vertical brand, direct to consumer, great experience, great marketing. Amazon sells mattresses, but the people who buy on Casper, they would probably not buy from Amazon. It's not the same experience, not the same mindset. So Casper will never be as big as Amazon, but it's not their purpose. Their purpose is serving their target customers the best they can, delivering the best experience, and thriving in their own niche. Okay. So now, if we're back at our little framework, gorillas, chimps, monkeys. I will share my, my own opinion, but the gorilla is gonna be Today, it looks like it's Amazon. Google may change the game. Maybe Walmart, if they, they keep pushing. It's, uh, by the way, you, you have probably noticed that Walmart is also part of the Google Alliance, by, by part of the Google Shopping platform. So they're really playing on both sides. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you say that in, in the US. They don't, play, they don't put all their eggs in the same basket, right? Yeah. Uh, the chimps, so these are all the traditional retailers taken individually. Right, they are the chimps. They, they, they are condemned to execute, to follow. If Google say, okay, if Amazon says a new standard is free same day delivery, then they all have to follow. And that's, that's the dynamic here. And lastly, the monkeys. So these are the uh, smaller companies that are thriving in their own, uh, in their own sweet spot. So that, that's it for, uh, for the, I'd say, the academic analysis. But from a more pragmatic, pragmatic point of view, uh, so what now? What now for us? Okay, we know those guys have superpowers. We know they're big. We know they are innovating super fast. Um, and it's gonna be hard to, to catch up with them. I, I checked the number last week. Amazon, over the last five years, grew on average 24% per year. This is, we're talking about a $700 billion company in terms of market cap, growing that fast. And for the next five years, they're expected to grow on average 16% a year. 
that's unheard of. A company that size growing that fast, it's, it's just something new, and we're still trying to grasp what it means for us. But we have a few ideas of what we can do. First is finding your positioning regarding the GAFAs. What can you do? The, easy, the cheap and easy thing to do is to plug into the system. So basically, you're a retailer. You put your address and your opening hours in Google Maps so that people can find you. It's cheap. It's fast. You should do it. It's a no-brainer. The second one is competing head-on. So that's where Walmart is. They want to compete head-on with Amazon. That's harsh because Amazon, as I said, growing so fast, has the first mover advantage, setting the standards. So you have to redouble down to basically uh, run faster than Amazon, and that's not something easy to do. The third part is partnering. So that's the Google Alliance. That's the strategy that Walmart, so Walmart is actually in both of those uh, squares, is competing head-on and partnering. Partnering, creating alliances, it's also something that we see a lot happening in Europe. So if I'm going to talk about France, uh, which I know fairly well, uh, we have a retailer there, which is called Carrefour. Um, they are kind of a target, if you will. Um, and they recently announced a partnership with a FNAC. FNAC is a leading distributor in France of cultural products, so books, uh, media. And FNAC recently acquired Darty, which was the uh, leading uh, electronics, like home appliances company. And the new CEO of Carrefour is the former CEO of FNAC. So you see that we're, I think we're going to see a lot of concentration because, as I said, uh, size matters in that industry. You need to reach a scale uh, under which you're not relevant, uh, b before which you're not relevant. And lastly, differentiate. So that's the, um, that's the approach of the monkeys, right? Find your sweet spot. It's more of a marketing approach as opposed to a more um, strategic and operational one. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. Find, just find your position, find your place in that chaos. But that's, that's not enough, right? You're ambitious. You want to, I don't know, get superpowers by yourself. So how do you acquire superpowers? That's the second question because, I mean, why not? Why should that be only a, a privilege for the GAFAs? Well, the thing is, it's difficult. It's really difficult. I'm going to use a word that I don't like, and it's digital transformation. And I'm sure you all know why I don't like it, because it, it's become a buzzword. Uh, we don't exactly know what it means. And yet, it's something that we all live with, sell, use, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to, use, to give you my own version of digital transformation. Those companies, they have superpowers. And the reason is not that they have sensors in the store. It's not that they have... Um, clean databases and that they have data they can access. That's not the reason. That's just the, the superstructure, it's just the surface. You, you could put stores, sensors in your stores, it's not gonna give you superpowers. What's giving you superpowers is what is at the roots, it's the people. So you need to change three things. We, 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 we use this framework. Uh, talent, culture, and money. So talent first, because the skills that you need to succeed in the new world order are not the same as we needed before. So it means that you need to hire differently. You need to hire different profiles of people, which means different incentive, different compensation plans. Um, I also worked uh, a lot with the car industry and uh, leading talent in AI. If you want someone who can run your uh, self-driving car project, it's $20 million. That's the, the ticket if you want to get in the game. Well, many traditional car companies, they're just not ready to pay that price. It doesn't fit somewhere in their, in their charts, right? So you need to acquire the talent, so you need to hire the right people, and you need to retrain your existing people. So that's the first thing. The second thing is culture, because you not only need to get the right people, you need to put them in the right environment. So you need to create an environment where you promote uh, initiative, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, innovation, and all of that sounds like empty words. Uh, it, sound, it sometimes sounds like, okay, we're just going to have a ping pong table, uh, Silicon Valley style. But there, is very, there are some really hard stuff behind that. Uh, I had the opportunity to discuss with LinkedIn about their company culture. And this permeates to the way they evaluate people. So the way you get your bonus at LinkedIn is not the, the traditional way a company would do it. That it's aligned with their culture, so they have five key points in their culture, and you are evaluated based on those five key points, uh, like if you help your co-workers, your co 
And this is what is going to decide if you get your bonus or not. But that's, that's not how we used to think. So culture is the, the second point. And by the way, since we're in Vegas, uh, you probably know Zappos, right? The e-commerce uh, company selling shoes that got acquired by, by Amazon a few years ago. Uh, you can visit the company. They have an amazing, qu quite extreme, uh, disruptive culture. And you can tour uh, the company, actually. I think it's like 10 bucks. You have to register online. But it's really interesting to see it in action. You, uh, I mean, they're all borderline crazy. But it's, it's, uh, it's really eye-opening. That's the extreme uh, case of what you can do in terms of, of culture. And the third point is money. And I guess, now, I guess now it's quite obvious, because changing this and that is going to cost a lot of money. It means that you have you, your leadership has to be ready and prepared to invest in innovation, which means taking risk, which means postponing dividends, which means going against everything they've been um, trained to do. Uh, and and, and that's, that, that's a big one. Uh, at Faber Novel, we work a lot with, um, at executive committee level because we believe that's where the change starts. So first, you need to trigger the mindset change at the executive committee level. And when I talk with a client, the first question as I ask is, OK, in your committee, how many people are like out of like how many people are for transformation or against transformation, if I may speak like that? Because you want to know the inertia at the top of the company, because then it trickles down to the whole company. And then once you have the, once the leadership is on board, then you can make stuff happen. But that's the first thing, because you need the money. And that's also why, and that's something we discussed, I think, with uh, Chuck also. That's also why um, founders, when they're still at the head of the company, like Jeff Bezos, can make things happen that a non-founder, that a CEO, but a non-founder CEO cannot make happen. So digital transformation. And uh, that's pretty much it. There is one last topic I'd like to discuss, if we have a few more minutes. I don't know. Yeah? So. When I look at that picture, I'm, uh, I'm baffled. Uh, the guy here with the glasses, he's smiling like crazy, and he's holding two iPhone 10. So I assume he just spent $2,000 on phones, and he's happy with that. I don't know about you, but I don't know many brands that have that effect, right? Where you spend a ton of money, and actually people take pictures of you showing, showing your grocery bag. I don't do that uh, uh, with my grocery bags uh, when I shop. Well, I get it delivered anyway, so. The, that's, uh, that's love. And my, my last topic, uh, I'm going to discuss love and what I think is the future of retail. I think it's transactions with love. That's, that's a big difference. So wh what, do I, what do I mean with that? Transactions, that's the... That's the necessary stuff that you have to do. It's business as rule, it's operations, it's uh, payment, delivery, all that stuff. Love is the little magic that you add on top that make your customer fall in love with you. Love is a lot of things. Love is intimacy, it's experience, it's emotion, it's community. Behind those words, there are like tangible stuff. Intimacy means that you know your customer, so you have the data, you can access it, you can create customized experience. Experience, it's giving a physical, having a physical relationship with, <laughs> with your customer, if I may say it like that. Uh, when, you, when you ship a product to a customer, it's not love, it's transaction. But when the customer receives the shipping one day earlier, that's love. When you charge a customer with a credit card, it's not love. But when you use technology to make it seamless, like in Amazon Go, that's love. Uh, when you open a store, it's not love, it's just transaction. You need a space to process the transaction. But when you make that place uh, uh, um, the center of the city, a place for community, for gathering, when people can just come, meet their friends there, have a coffee, that's love. So it's really about creating this identity, creating this, this feeling. And this is actually why traditional retailers still have one natural competitive advantage. Walmart has more physical points of contact with their client that Amazon will have for a long time. So this is where they really need to step up their game. They need to give love. They have this 
amazing asset. But now we're not using it to deliver the product anymore. Not, I mean, we still do, of course, but if you can ship the product to the client, then why should he come to the store? Well, because now the store is a place where you deliver the love. So that's really the, the key idea I'd like to, 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 to share with you. The, the, the store has to go beyond his transactional function and become the place where you create the experience, the love. Uh, I don't know if Philip's here. I, I've, I've been to the beta stores a few times. It's amazing. It's amazing, and, and that's something we need to, to learn from. And so, to wrap it up, uh, a quote by Jeff Bezos. I've talked a lot about competition, but don't get me wrong. This is not about competition. It's really about the customer. That's what Jeff Bezos says. It's not about competitor's obsession, or business model obsession, or product obsession, or technology obsession. It's about customer obsession. So as long as we serve our customers right, and as long as we make them fall in love with us, we'll always have a place for them and some value to bring uh, to them. So that's it for, for now. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions now. Okay, can y'all hear me? Okay, really interesting that you touched on intimacy and love, and that's one of the things at High Street we talk about a lot, on how Amazon has used data and intention to make it feel like you're working with humans, right? Mm. It makes it feel like you have an intimate relationship with them, and how you ended this is a very different way than how we approach our retail stores. There's a thread of servitude, there's a thread of making sure that what you're doing is creating real emotional currency. And that's an important point for those of us, whether you're just in retail or working in digital experience design, because again, what we're talking about is using the technology to create intimacy, as Ed always says, to make things feel more human, not less human. And how can we as an industry be inspired by that? And that's really worth pondering on, not only internally with our organizations, but with the strategies that we look to ignite in these stores. So who's got some questions? Thanks, great presentation. I, I think that, you know, I, to just echo your, your last point, I think one of the big issues, and you talk about the superpowers, um, and it's the point that I, I try to get my clients to understand more and more, which is, you know, that most of the retailers aren't focused the way Amazon is focused on the customer experience. Um, do you have any good examples of, of, of uh, retailers who you think, uh, and Phil had some good examples earlier, do you have any examples of retailers who you think that are maybe monkeys uh, or chimps that are, are really taking the same kind of customer uh, focus that uh, Amazon is taking? Oh, yeah, absolutely, and I would say that today it's a must, if, especially if you want to be a monkey, so one of those smaller, very agile uh, companies, you, you must be at least as good as Amazon, if not more. Um, I mean, almost any company on my slides, maybe I can, yeah. Most of those companies, uh, if you think about Casper, for example. Casper, uh, you order a mattress. You, it's delivered at home. You don't like it. You don't need to say why, you can return it, I think it's within one or two months. They come, they pick it up, no question asked. When do we see that happen? Um, another example, so it's Amazon, but it's a personal story that happened to me, so I want to share it. Uh, I ordered something from Amazon last week, uh, two weeks ago, never arrived. I chat with the guy, uh, it's written as delivered, right? It's written, it's in the mail room, so, uh, well, within two minutes, like, really in like four lines, he said, okay, I refund you and reorder it, and I'll send it uh, one day delivery for free. That's trust, that's love. I, I congratulate the I felt like I was, re -treated, uh, I was discussing with a friend who was, and I love the guy. I left him a, a, a brilliant review, and I'm talking about that. I'm promoting Amazon here right now on stage, just because they, they treated me with love, with care. Uh, I think uh, it was Kat who mentioned the, I don't know who mentioned the care factor yesterday. That's, that's another way to phrase it really. Um, and yes, any of those companies, Casper is really good at that. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, 
Stitch Fix for sure. So Stitch Fix is in a, in a different way. So I'm just trying to grasp what's the essence of the thing. The way Stitch Fix gives you love is uh, with AI. So love also is intimacy. That's what I, I, I said a little further down the road. Love is intimacy. Intimacy is knowing the people. You know your family. You know what they like. So you should know what your clients like. Stitch Fix uses uh, artificial intelligence to know you, know what you like, learn from the product that you return. So it's a clothing, uh, they deliver close to you. And they learn from what you return and what you don't like. So that at the end of the day, they only show you stuff that you love. So they're building knowledge of the client at scale so that they can address uh, hundreds of thousands of clients. Very huge now. Um, they actually, yeah, they appeared recently. And this is how you use technology to deliver love at scale. So, um, I hope it answers your question. We talk a lot about, too, what we call the caring crisis in traditional brick and mortar, particularly those who are unenlightened as compared to Phil. And it, it really is a big deal because we're all shoppers, too. And how often do you go in these brick and mortar stores and not only do you feel uncared for, you feel resentful? And what we're talking about today, these are the new expectations for every point of shopping. And, and this is one of the things also to really think about from today is the role of the store to actually show that you care and the role of the technology to serve people and to create the kind of emotional currency that's going to make them feel loved. It's a big aspirational word, but if you love a store and experience, you become irrationally loyal to it. And that's how you make sure that people don't shop you on an app because they just can't bear to go in and get that awful experience at the cash register. Yeah. And it's, it seems like common sense, but it's a big yeah. opportunity. Absolutely. And another important point here is that love is not just about the interpersonal relationship that the, the customer will have with the sales assistant. It's also in the, the way you use technology to deliver that love at scale. Uh, when you get into an Apple store, actually you will not notice a lot of electronics, except for the product you will not notice a lot of digital signage. By the way, this, if it's a trend, it's maybe not good for the industry. Uh, but the tech is hidden, but it's there. And when you step in, the, 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 the stores are peppered with technology, but you, you don't see it. And when you go and, uh, and go to Genius Bar or go talk to a sales assistant, they know you. They know you because they have access to the data. And so my point here is that love goes beyond just having a good talk with the client or asking the right questions. It's also knowing your client because you have the technology. So that's why tech is, uh, is so successful. That's why tech wins, because it can do stuff at scale and uh, fake love in a very convincing way. And when you can put that with real humans, you can use the technology and the fake Absolutely. love, and that's, that's the edge, isn't that's, it? That's the brilliance of it, yeah.